and uh, she said, you know, I have to tell you something. I said, what's that? She said, you and Dietrich go back a long way. I said, well, what do you mean by that? I don't know if I ever told you this or not. She said, you've known him for a long time. I said, well, yeah, I've known him for a couple of years. She said, oh, no, 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 you've known him a long time. She said, how about centuries? I said, okay, elaborate. She said, well, she said, you guys have been warriors together and done battle together with each other, not fighting each other, but against the powers to be. And I went back and I told him this, and you know, the, ir the irony of the situation is that's exactly what we do. We all fight the powers to be. In 86 or 88, I, I forget what year it was, I took a seminar up in Toronto on pain disorders. I was director of a pain clinic in uh, Michigan, and uh, I saw on this list that Dr. Klinghart was going to be up there, and I'd heard his name before, and I said, I have to go to this one, and there was a bunch of German names, so I wanted to be sure this wasn't a new uprising for the Nazi party, so I went up there. <laughs> But anyway, I heard him lecture, and he talked about low back pain and the autonomic nervous system. And I, my, my, I said, this guy really knows what he's talking about. And at the end of the lecture, he stood out, and he just shook hands with everybody and had the opportunity to shake his hands. And I said, nice to meet you. And I looked at him, and, I, and it was like we had been friends for centuries. And I haven't washed my hand to this day. <laughs> When I, when I look at my friend here, I think I see um, a little bit of Albert Einstein reincarnated. Um, and, and I think you all understand that. I think you agree with that. It's just me and Albert have the same hairdresser. <laughs> Dietrich, as you know, is an MD and a PhD, and he's got more accolades down to his kneecap than you can shake a stick at. And I'm going to turn over the podium to him, a dear friend, a friend to all of us, and a mentor to all of us, Dietrich Klinghart. I'm going to do a little wake up song. <laughs> okay, so you just kind of sing along with this. This is just kind of sort of a round of, of singing so you can all wake up. <laughs> okay, um, here's, here's the song. I feel my feet are walking on the land Greeting the day with an open hand My heart is singing as the day begins I fall in love with my Lord again So this is how it goes, I have to, let me put this a little higher here This, this, I know Okay, so I feel my feet walking on the land, greeting the day with an open hand. My heart is singing as the day begins. I fall in love with my Lord again. You can say with myself again if you're not a Christian. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. I just want to accommodate everybody. Okay, here we go. How about now, Jew when you get the, <laughs> when you get the uh, the words, then crank up the volume a little bit because that's kind of what what opens the system. Okay, here we go. I feel my feet walking on the land. Greeting the day with an open hand My heart is singing as the day begins I fall in love with my soul 
feel my feet walking on the land Greeting the day with an open hand My heart is singing as the day begins I fall in love with my Lord again That was not bad And so now, now there's like two complications in the song that, that come up When um, I feel my feet walking on the land Greeting the day with an open hand You lift your arms up in your seat as you are, <coughs> greeting the day with an open hand. Oh, why don't you stand up for the song? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, when the greeting of the day part comes, you lift your palms up to the heaven, and then when the heart part comes, you put your hands over your heart. And then when the beginning comes around again, you just let your hands go and relax. Okay. I feel my feet walking on the land Greeting the day with an open hand My heart is singing as the day begins I fall in love with myself again Louder! I feel my feet walking on the land Greeting the day with an open hand My heart is singing as the day begins I fall in love Walking on the land, greeting the day with an open hand. My heart is singing as the day begins. I fall in love with my Lord again. Last time, now this time, all those singers amongst you, you're happy, you're welcome to sing harmony with me. But if you do, it has to be loud. <laughs> okay. Now this time, close your eyes on this last round. Okay. I feel my feet walking on the land Greeting the day with an open hand My heart is singing as the day begins I fall in love with my Lord again so Keep your eyes closed just for a moment longer And just kind of feel the niceness and the goodness of this And then you can take your seat. <coughs> Thanks for participating with me. <laughs> <laughs> now, is Ed here already? Um, well. Okay, well, let's I just interrupt uh, later because we're going to have little sections of this talk. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, trying to review this morning uh, with you some of the um, <coughs> principles of um, how the teeth fit in with the rest of the body and how everything kind of swings and sings together and how we can uh, improve our outcome <coughs> in trying to get patients well uh, by understanding a few principles and a few technical aspects. Um, one is I want to introduce the uh, intraosseous neural therapy that Dr. Elmayan has uh, uh, really single-handedly uh, conceived and, and uh, uh, created. And um, I don't know how we're going to do time-wise. We made uh, put this part on the end of the, after the last lecture today. Are you going to be here yeah, at, at 4.30 or whenever that's going to fall? Um, or are we going to tag it onto my lecture in the morning or we split it half and half? We don't know yet, but just keep in mind there's a, a section of my lecture that Ara's going to give. It's going to be an integral part of understanding uh, the, the system I'm going to try uh, to give to you. Let me zip through a, a couple of principles that are um, that have been most important uh, uh, for me. This is a, um, a concept of a, a healing system, how things really are. Um, I call this at the time the four component balance theory of chronic pain and uh, meanwhile realized that this applies to all chronic illnesses. Um, most of us have an intuitive understanding of this. Uh, this is actually based on a lot of review, a lot of articles and research and 
trying to break it down. And was a lecture I got an award for uh, in, in Spain at a physiatric uh, meeting. Um, I haven't, this is my own drawing, and I, I'm not one of those computer wizards who can uh, whisk out, you know, like these nice color, four color uh, kind of computerized schematics or so. But so don't let yourself be deterred by that. So what we did, we broke down the, the elements of really what, when you, when you get a chronic pain patient to get well, what are the elements that you need to address to get this patient well? Uh, most of us come from this monomanic sort of uh, background, you know, that if you're a chiropractor, we punch that atlas and we punch it again and we punch it again and punch it again. If you're from that school of chiropractors, I don't want to put down chiropractors because uh, lots of chiropractors now understand this system better than most of us and do wonderful multifactorial treatment. But you know, if you're, if you're a neurosurgeon, you take discs out, and if you can't take the disc out, you send the patient to a psychiatrist and tell them, well, <coughs> it's all in your head, because that's the two things you know. It's either in your territory, and if it's not, uh, the, it's a fault of the patient. A lot of blame going on out in the medical community, blaming the patient for not responding to our treatment. You know, that one thing that we have, if you're an acupuncturist, you stick needles, and you stick needles, and you stick needles. And if you're a really cool MD who's really holistic, you know, um, the first step, you know, most of us do, like in holistic medicine, is we learn one other alternative treatment, and that we impose that on every patient that we have, you know. <laughs> like, you know, when we learned about vitamin C, everybody got put on a drip with vitamin C, um, you know, until it came out of their ears. And if the patient didn't respond, it was still the same answer. Well, something's wrong with the patient. You know, he doesn't want to get well, or you know, or whatever our psychology allowed us. We we dealt with it. And the truth of it is, uh, there are several components in chronic illness and chronic pain that we need to be aware of. And um, so, uh, let me kind of grab uh, here number. Th uh, let me kind of give you an overview, and then we kind of look at some of the details. And I want to keep it very practical. Uh, I'm, I'm talking now as if I'm talking just to dentists, being aware that there's a lot of other practitioners here that work with dentists, yeah? But to, to give you that, that common understanding. So the first problem that we have that needs to be addressed is the structure of the body. And the only structural injury that cannot be healed with time and with exercise is the occlusion. <laughs> so the dentists sit at a, at a spot um, where, where they have access to one of the four major components of chronic illness, and only the dentist can resolve that one. And um, I want to um, highlight a couple of things. Now, I know there's going to be a dental lecture by somebody uh, very carefully handpicked by Ed Arana. I know a lot of people here in the room. <coughs> and by the way, let me, let me kind of stop for a moment and kind of acknowledge, I know there's a lot of people here in the room that know about everything that I lecture, about every component I lecture, a lot more than I do. And also, like, let me acknowledge, like, many people here in the room, when I, when I look around, you know, have been my mentors and my teachers, and are, are, are brilliant in their own field and go totally unacknowledged. You know, by the time we go home on Sunday, their name will never have been mentioned. I know there is a lot of you here who, who really have, I mean, there's an exceptional, if a bomb would fall in this room, you know, America would have lost, you know, probably half of their most uh, advanced healers, you know. And, and so I just want to acknowledge you here in the room. I also want to acknowledge my, uh, the personal friends uh, that I have here in the room, all of which I've uh, terribly neglected in the last few years, just simply because time has become such a rare commodity. And like other people have vitamin deficiencies and nutrient deficiencies. Many of us have time deficiencies, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm, I'm terribly guilty of that, and I want to just take the moment here to acknowledge that and apologize to, to all of you, you know, who've, who've been here, <coughs> who've been my close friends, and still they never hear from me, other than, you know, at the occasional meetings or so. Um, okay, so with that, uh, with that said, uh, the structural injury, there's a couple of things that stand out um, <laughs> that, uh, that you can do. One um, is the alpha appliance. It's, it's a, a small wire appliance for the upper jaw. It gives a gentle upper jaw expansion that actually has been created by somebody here in the room, um, by, by Derek Nordstrom. Derek, would you, would you raise your hand if you're here? 
Okay, stand, stand up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and and those of you who don't know the Alpha Pines, please uh, grab Derek in a break or somewhere and talk to him about it. It's a it's an offshoot, a far offshoot of the Crozat appliance, but it is much more tiny wires. It is tiny, it's invisible. It gives a gentle jaw expansion, and it opens the cranium like no other device that I've seen in a gentle way, um, where uh, this the, the structural component is addressed in a way that I've never seen addressed that gently. And that's something, because of the nature of the appliance, that that any one of you can do who is a dentist who can take a an, an imprint of the of the mouth, <laughs> and uh, when you start your your the TMJ related stuff, you know I know many of you have done this for 20 years, and you have all your other ways, and that doesn't apply to you. But those of you who start out, there is an appliance that you can learn. It's a no-brainer, <laughs> and it's fantastic what it does for people. The other one that I just want to mention on the structural level is uh, the crossing midline. You know, if you have a bridge. Uh, that crosses the midline in the middle. It locks up your craniosacral mechanism, and it's the worst structural injury that we've seen, usually creating severe distortions um, in the psychology of people. They become depressed, they become psychotic, they become psychopaths, um, but also headaches and, and other things are, are common. And uh, Jerry Smith, one of our dental friends, has uh, created a very simple uh, device you know, where he saw the bridge open in the middle, you know, just take a chainsaw or whatever it is that the dentist <laughs> takes and just kind of cut the, the bridge in the middle and then you glue in from the back this little thing, it's a little device that allows for lateral movement of the teeth uh, and therefore allows for the cranial expansion and contraction to happen, you know, 12 times or so a minute. And uh, again, these are two things any dentist here in the room uh, can do right away and get like so much done on the structural level. Yeah, that was the one thing I wanted to uh, to give you on this. Now, let's talk to, uh, about uh, number four, the neurochemical changes in the CNS. Uh, this is a psycho-emotional component. Most of you here are aware that it is a component. Uh, most of you are not aware how important it is. I just picked up an article on the airplane. Uh, this is uh, an interview with uh, the two folks that started the science called psychoneuroimmunology. Uh, and uh, here's just a, a little thing I found on the teeth. Um, <laughs> they're reporting on a study that's going on on a dental project they have. We're getting nice results on the dental project, Jan reports, her voice lifting with enthusiasm. The dental study reinforces the forearm wound results. There was another study among 19 patients who had dental surgery in Ohio State's hospital. Those who scored highest on a stress test healed 50% more slowly than the others. Simply meaning your bone cavitation healing um, is very, very much determined whether uh, the, the surgery is done at a time when the patient is in a high stress um, situation in their life. This is not related to the stress from the, from the uh, dentistry, but stress they're going through a divorce, they're going through some other type of thing. Uh, if they do, their chances of healing from the surgery are very poor. And most of you know that's been a problem. You know, in my experience, from my observation, you know, only 50 to 60 percent of the of the dental surgeries that I've witnessed here the first time around properly. They have to be resurgerized and resurgerized. I give some other rationale for that in a in a moment, why that also may be. But don't uh, keep in mind that this is an important component here. I'm not going to talk to you about psychological factors. I do teach a course called psychokinesiology, which is a very elegant, uh, rapid uh, approach to this. But your patients should have a healthy hygiene in terms of their stress management. You know, they should do some form of prayer or meditation. Um, they should do, you know, some exercise. You know, they should do some some stretching, um, some aerobic exercise, and so forth. To, to manage their stress levels. If they don't do it, it is their responsibility when they don't get well after the surgery. If somebody requires a tooth extraction for whatever health reasons they have, and they're not taking responsibility for their stress management, if the thing doesn't heal, put it back on the patient. But do it before you do the surgery. Hey, we have to take this tooth out, but I'm not sure whether it's going to heal the first time around because you're messing up in your life so badly that I don't know how your immune system is going to receive this. And then 
you're not having the responsibility that a patient heals, the patient has. Put it back on them. Yeah? So that was what I wanted to say about this component. Then the, the, this one here, the biochemical component, I wanted to introduce you to a, um, a new way of handling the biochemistry that we have <coughs> that has been really outstanding. Um, this uh, is based on a blood test, and the, the group is here called the Carbon-Based Corporation. We invited them to come here. Um, what this is, I, I just kind of show you a few, <coughs> few slides because it, it, um, <coughs> it is very simple what's behind that. Um, So the patient takes a normal blood test. This is a normal SMAC 24 blood profile you know, that you get for 49.95 at every lab in, in the country. And then they kind of put that in a computer, and the computer prints out these little bars that show, you know, if this is the midline where the, the normal values should be, and any, everything that deviates from there is indicated by the size of the bar how much it deviates. Then the computer puts this through six or 8,000 different calculations where the computer calculates all the ratios of the different things in relationship to, other, uh, to each other. Now, these guys spent 12 years of very solid research on this. This is not just a fly-by-night operation. Um, I know the, the path that this test has taken. I've followed that for the last couple of years. And finally, uh, by, by adding in one of the most brilliant computer people in the country, they managed to put this thing together where basically all the world literature <coughs> on vitamins and nutrients, for example, you know, like when the alkaline phosphatase is low and the cholesterol level is normal, these are two ingredients that indicate a low zinc level. Um, who knows that? You know, who can remember all those things? You know, and they have over 6,000 calculations in there of ratios with each other. And what it does, the computer then kind of prints out, um, first of all, the likelihood, the statistical likelihood of certain illnesses that you may have. Um, yeah, the brucellosis here, 66% likelihood that they have that. Uh, acute and subacute necrosis of the liver, 54% likelihood uh, because of the indicators in there. You can use, they got even the CDC, uh, the, the codes behind it. You can use those diagnostic codes and you have the backup in the world literature behind it why the patient now has this diagnosis. Um, then the, the next step that the computer does, it then feeds in all the literature on, on supplements and vitamins uh, to treat uh, these deviations from normal. And what, what, for example, it gives you here is like a list of the main uh, supplements that this person would need to normalize the biochemistry. The N-acetylcarnitine is for the fatty acid uh, mechanism, the most important nutrient and so on and so forth. It's not important now, and every patient gets a very individual kind of program back, what they should do. Now, the wonderful thing about this is, now, yes, there is some amongst you here that do EAV on a very high level or kinesiology on a very high level, and you can find the supplements that way. Or you know so much, you've read those 6,000 articles, and you think you remember them, and because of that, you are able to make your own decisions. But if a computer can do it, and this is like a, $90 test, the combination of the blood test and the lab test costs like $90. There's nothing in medicine you get for $90 anymore that gives you this much depth of insight, of individual insight about a patient. And so we've been using this test. I'm not making any money off this, but I've been so enthused about this. And since I've been teaching uh, the autonomic response testing to many of you, I want to let you know I've abandoned, you know, uh, at least in the initial round, uh, testing for, for supplements. I do the test. I send them off with the test box. It comes back two days later. I have it you know, on my fax machine, the results. I put them on the program, and I'm having far better results than anything that I've ever tested out myself. And so I just wanted to mention that to you. Check it out for yourself. Um, you, you can't really lose with this. Um, the, the guys in the, in the group, from, from what I've seen, are highly, highly ethical and they're not pushing this stuff on you and <coughs> often at the meetings I see them go totally unnoticed because they're just not the, the advertising American types, you know, sort of that are, um, know how to, you know, how to promote themselves. So, I, I, I yeah. It's called Carbon Based Corporation. They have a desk out here in the exhibit hall. Okay, so that was the, 
that was the biochemistry. And then uh, the, the last component we're left with is what I call the electromagnetic disturbances. This is everything that happens in the autonomic nervous system, in the sensory motor nervous system, in the brain, the central nervous system, and on the cell membrane. So it's either of electrical nature of or uh, of <coughs> magnetic nature. Little pearl for you guys, you know, that kind of really thrilled myself totally. Um, I read this article, like many of you have, on the cloning of the sheep experiment. And I've been aware you know, from reading the, the different journals that it has been tried many, many times and failed many, many times. And the, the trick that the researchers use in England, in Scotland, sorry, <laughs> Scotland, <laughs> <laughs> the trick that the researchers use, you know, they implanted the DNA of an adult sheep, you know, in the, in the cell, in an egg cell, um, <coughs> of, of, of in a female egg cell. And researchers in the past have never gotten this thing to grow once they put it in there. And the trick that they used was that they put two electrodes on the, on the egg cell imitating the normal electric activity in the autonomic nervous system. And once they did that, the thing grew you know, to a new sheep. So the trick was the electric spark that's supplied by the autonomic nervous system. Once they had that idea, you know, which I've been trying to preach to this group for the last uh, 20 years or so, um, they used the same trick and the same principle you know, to make life happen. And the, the point that I'm trying to make is if things aren't electrically okay in the mouth, your cavitation doesn't heal, or to start with, the teeth go sick, the jawbone goes sick, uh, these are all ultimately outcomes of a, a dysfunctional nervous system. And <coughs> of course, I believe that neural therapy is the most elegant way of treating this. Um, neural therapy being not different from acupuncture, you'll be treating the autonomic nervous system, one, has a tradition behind it that's very old and sometimes helpful, sometimes very confusing, and the other one has a fairly new tradition that's only 100 years old. Um, but if you bring them both together, um, there's tremendous uh, potential there. So uh, these are our four components. <coughs> now, I want to kind of highlight the point that when you address all these four components, um, you're going to get far better treatment results and when you just kind of hack on one of the components and hack on it and hack on it and hack on it. Like, you know, some of you TMJ dentists are guilty, you know, of doing a splint and doing another splint and another splint and another splint and another splint and another splint. And, another splint. and some of the, you know, holistic MDs here, you know, try the vitamin C and another dose of vitamin C and a higher dose of vitamin C and even higher dose of vitamin C and more vitamin C and they still didn't get the patient well. And I'm telling you, if you combine a splint and the vitamin C, you may see dramatic results. Because now you're filling up or you're emptying two of these cups uh, in, in the patient. And if you add in a little of psychological guidance, it may be even more dramatic. And if you add in the neural therapy with it, addressing uh, that component, you may even get more dramatic results. Okay, so I wanted to make that point in the beginning um, because it goes so forgotten and I'm starting all of my lectures this way. There was this um, senator in Rome um, that was at the time when Rome was in this, uh, had been in this war with Carthago. There was a, uh, was a city on the, on the um, yeah, I think it's uh, where Egypt is now, Egypt or Turkey, like on the other side of the coast. And they beaten Carthago terribly. I mean, they raped the women, they kind of, the Romans had really kind of almost destroyed the city, but it was still there. And the Romans were so scared because once, 100 years before then, they were almost defeated by it. And it stuck so deeply, you know, in the Romans that the senator ended any of his speeches, you know, he was speaking on how to uh, take care of the rats in Rome, you know, how they should buy more rats, uh, more traps, you know, for the rats and stuff. And he would uh, end any speech that he did with, uh, with a few words, uh, Citerum sensio Carthaginum as a delendum, which means, and I suggest that Carthago should be destroyed. <laughs> so it didn't matter when he talked about the problems of housewives in Rome or so, like some minute problems. He ended every speech he gave with this sentence. And eventually, it was ingrained in the Romans so strong that they went over there and destroyed Carthago. You know, it was Hannibal, you know, the guy who came with the elephants over the mountains. And so that's why I'm starting every one of my lectures with the four components until it comes out of the ears <laughs> and eyes and nose 
of everybody until you can't hear it anymore, you know? <laughs> okay, so with this in mind, I want to get uh, right into the, the, um, the main thing. Now, I've forgotten. Um, can any one of you lend me the handout that I've written? Oh, here, hang on, hang on, I've got it here somewhere. Okay, so what I want to present to you is like a new view of the jawbone that comes out of the workings of the German toxicologist Max Daunderer. Daunderer is the guy who basically has promoted the DMPS for the last 20 years. He's sort of behind all the modern detox ways that we have of detoxing uh, dentists and their patients. And he has gone on, he's publishing a paper every month with the latest research on this. And this is his last edition. I kind of want to go over it with you because there's been so much uh, new information that we need to, to have. First of all, he found that the body concentrates insecticides, pesticides, and solvents at the roots of teeth that are slightly ill. So that means if you have a bad occlusion and one tooth gets pounded repeatedly, the root of the tooth gets inflamed, and because of the high blood flow and vascularity in the area, um, we don't know the mechanism. The body starts to accumulate at the root of the teeth um, certain ones of the environmental toxins that get compounded in the area. He did biopsies in the jawbone, and just kind of to show you a few things, F here means stands for form aldehyde. In the, in the, at the bottom of the roots of the central teeth, and high up in the ramus of the, of the jawbone, uh, we concentrate high doses of form aldehyde. Um, L, in the condyle itself, we concentrate solvents. Many of you who have worked with us know how we've been hacking on the solvent issue. Yeah? Any one of you who is in contact with rubbing alcohol every day, <coughs> the rubbing alcohol ends up in the condyle here, destroying the bone. Um, and that's even minute amounts. They don't go anywhere else in the body. This is where they go. Um, in between, uh, uh, sorry, uh, here uh, above the, the upper jaw, um, we concentrate various things. Uh, one is dioxin. Um, uh, the other one uh, is amalgam and palladium. And I want to get into the x-ray findings. Now, Dandra has related the x-ray findings on the panoral x-ray with his biopsies, and I'm going to go over the list with you. Um, so you kind of get a, I translated his text, it's on page, I don't know, it's in your handout. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go over that, and I have it written down, do you have it in the handout? Please, for the dentists here, but also for the MDs, use this, because we can now, from the dental x-ray, from the panoral x-ray, diagnose most of these toxic issues in the jawbone. Now, um, it's yeah, the dental component, that's what it says. It should be on the second page of that. Uh, Bob? Would it be possible for us to get some copies of that slide? Of this one here? Yeah. Sure, I have it. It's in the neural type PC handout. It's, uh, you have to take the neural therapy C workshop, but <laughs> you you get it. You, you get it. I give I give you this thing, and you can make a, a copy for. I put you in charge of it. Okay. So, um, first of all, um, I'm, I'm I'm telling you these things because we have a solution to this, which is very new and very dramatic and very simple. It's so idiot uh, proof that it makes me sick. Um, <laughs> This is the maxillary sinus here, and what you see here, these two black lines, um, that's the, uh, it looks like the bottom of a lake, the, the slime on the bottom of, the, of a lake, that's amalgam. When you see this, and you see this in almost <coughs> every panoral x-ray, you see these lines at the lower part of the maxillary sinus, that's amalgam. If you biopsy it, it is loaded uh, with mercury, with copper, uh, with silver, and other things. Now, palladium, those, those of you who probably say, well, I don't have an amalgam problem, I have gold in my mouth, most likely you have an alloy of gold with some palladium in it. Palladium is very nasty, should not be used in dentistry anymore. There's a lot of research on that now, and Vera 
uh, is going to report on that. Vera Steiskol is here, who is one of my big heroes, who is a top Swedish researcher on the, on the issues of amalgam toxicity and allergy to the dental materials. So palladium, in turn, is more like bright lines that go through here. And you see it in almost every patient who has gold crowns, nice crown and bridge work in the mouth. You know, they're doing miserably, but they know it's not their teeth because they have gold in their teeth and it doesn't affect them. And this is what you see. You see these, um, these type of whitish <coughs> lines there. Now, um, I just go through the list here. Amalgam, <laughs> amalgam on the dental roots looks like spiral-like brightness around the roots. Yeah, this is like around the roots. You see this little bright kind of, almost like, like somewhere you wrapped a, a silver wire around it. Um, okay, the amalgam lake. Yeah, he calls this amalgam lake. This can have different shapes and forms, but this is usually how it looks like. Um, gold on the roots, bright hard strips around the roots. These are sort of like, rather than so nice rounded things, they are sort of like, looks more like bright bars across the roots. Uh, that's gold irons that are impregnated there. Uh, palladium on the roots, uh, the outline of the roots appears to be ha hazy as if the root is dissolving. Now. All of you dentists know that one, yeah? Where you kind of look and you kind of say, hey, you know, where is this root going up here? It kind of seems to sort of vanish away. Usually these are teeth that ha had gold crowns or gold fillings, and that is the long-term effect of the palladium. The root is dissolving, but it is from the palladium, and if you can get the gold off there, often they make a remarkable recovery, yeah? Um, other metals, aluminum, lead, bismuth, leave soft white dots around the roots or the neck of the tooth. So these are soft white dots around the tooth or somewhere around here. Okay, now uh, the inhaled toxins. Dunro was able to determine the age of the toxin exposure according to how deep the toxin has spread <coughs> from the supplying artery into the jawbone. Um, basically what he does, he sees how far has the uh, the toxin migrated in the mandible from the central canal into the tissues. He was able to, to determine the age of, the, almost like a psychic, he says, well, this is 22 years. And he went back in the history of, of the patient, and 22 years ago they worked in a paper mill, or they did something that exposed them to dioxin. So he was being able to do that that precisely. Um, so uh, if, if the toxin deposit was found in the cortical bone. It was 30 years or more since exposure. That's how long it travels from here to here. And usually you catch it anywhere in between. Um, so form aldehyde looks like pin set pinhead sized white dots, which are perfectly round in the area of the angle of the jaw. Yeah? So it would be in this area, little white pinheads. Um, that's form aldehyde. Mercury looks like soft white nebulous level at the bottom of the sinus. Okay, so, um, yeah, I said, that, I said that the wrong way around because he, uh, it's the same, uh, in Germany it's terrible. Yeah, so, <laughs> in the x-ray it's white, but he kind of made a copy of an x-ray and then the drawing of it. So the mercury was white and the palladium was dark. Yeah, so. Um, Platinum um, settles as a soft line at the bottom of the sinus, especially if the patient is already mercury toxic. So he basically has found the same thing that I've been preaching. When a patient is mercury toxic, it traps all the other toxins. And one of them is platinum, which of course many of you thought was innocent. And Vera is going to, uh, I hope, Vera, are you here? Yep. Okay. You're probably going to confirm that platinum at least is not always harmless. <laughs> I trust that you will do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so platinum settles very much at the bottom. Is a soft, uh, soft line here. Um, solvents um, form dark round circular deposits like a lake. So solvents often kind of cause major kind of, you know, when you look at the panel, you think it's an <coughs> artifact. You see this dark kind of area here. Sort of, they say, well, it's just kind of, you know, more <coughs> translucent or so. That is usually solvent deposits, and of course, we can, with our autonomic response testing, confirm all of these easily. You know, we we test off the X-ray, 
and we can throw our, I have uh, you know, test bottles for these different things, you know, formaldehyde, dioxin, and so forth. And this is resonance principle, you know, if, if you hold the area that you suspect on the x-ray, you know, your, your autonomic response leads to a change in muscle tone, and you throw a bottle of formaldehyde on the patient, it goes strong again, you know that's formaldehyde. And I could confirm all his findings, which usually I can. I mean, he's sort of like, he's not a nice man, he doesn't talk to me but he is still one of my heroes <laughs> because his intuition has led him to the right, uh, to the right things. Now his conclusion, uh, I, I disagree with, his conclusion now is, well, he did a study on uh, MS patients where he did one group of 10 patients, another group of 10 patients. The one group of 10 patients, all the teeth that had amalgam fillings, he removed the teeth. He didn't drill the amalgam, he removed the teeth. All of those 10 patients became completely well and asymptomatic. The other group of 10 patients, he had the uh, amalgam fillings removed in the best way we know with the suction and the rubber dam and all that. And out of 10 people, eight got well. Uh, sorry, out of 10 people, eight stayed sick and two got well. So his conclusion was, um, if you have a patient with that you want to clean up uh, the amalgam issue and the patient has a severe neurological problem, you should remove the teeth instead of drilling out the amalgam. Now, I disagree with that, and uh, because we have a, a program now um, where we get very close to to 100%. And um, Carol, are you here, Carol? Oh yeah. Uh, Carol, now we decided since this is a fundraising seminar, I'm not giving this to you. You buy this for five bucks from Carol, um, so we make a little bit extra money on this one. Um, it's it's a lecture I gave on how to detox a patient, especially around the time of dentistry. Yeah, and many of you know I've been struggling with this issue for many years, and I feel we have now a dynamite program that works, uh, that is extremely safe for the patient, and is easily repeatable, and doesn't endanger the dentist. They're all natural substances um, that can be used in the right way to protect the patient. Okay, uh, then we have uh, pesticide. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, okay, pesticides. Um, Okay, they look very much uh, also again like these dark round lakes, but they have a very sharp demarcated margin. So if, if there's a dark lake that kind of, you don't know where it ends and where it starts, it's solvents. If it has a sharp margin around, it's a pesticide, the organochlorins, organophosphates, um, which many of you are aware of, are all having estrogen-like effects on us. That means they're, they're uh, catabolic in nature. And I was thrilled yesterday uh, hearing Chris' lecture on giving anabolic uh, steroids. Um, I have my own, own solution of that, but basically the, the solution that you get the patient in an anabolic <coughs> state is so important when you do uh, cavitation surgery <coughs> and you avoid so many failures. Now, with that in mind, down where did a study where he said, well then, you know, when we take a tooth out, how come, you know, 50% kind of get well and 50% don't? So what he did, he took the tooth out and then biopsied the jawbone. And he found form al just looking for formaldehyde and dioxin and metals. So he found contamination in the, in the site around it, cleaned it up, let it heal for three months or so, and then reoperated it. And lo and behold, it took 25 to 30 surgeries, mm. 25 to 30 surgeries before the next biopsy was negative and the jawbone was clean. And now, now here's the, the, so the main point, the main point, oh, unfortunately we're not set up to make drawings here, I think. Uh, is there any pens we have or something? Marcus, do, do we have? Oh, thanks, Chris. Yeah, yeah, turn on the light a little bit. So the, the, um, the point I'm trying to make here is, so the point I'm trying to make now is like the, the core part of my lecture here is um, something about detox. Uh, how does the brain get toxic? We have this thing called the blood-brain barrier. Mercury does not enter the brain from the bloodstream. You can have all the mercury is circulating in the blood, it does not enter the bloodstream, but mercury gets easily dumped into the connective tissue. 
from the bloodstream. And in the connective tissue, you have the autonomic nerve endings. And the Swedish study on axonal transport, transport of mercury showed very clearly it gets picked up by the nerve endings, and within 24 hours, it's in the spinal cord. And once <coughs> it's in the spinal cord, it's in the brain, because there is no brain barrier between the spinal cord and the brain. It's an extension of the brain. And within 24 hours, it's from the spinal cord into the brain. So it doesn't enter the body through the bloodstream. And all the detox things that we've been looking at um, with the DMPS and deep penicillin that were kind of stupid, because we were looking at something that was crossing the blood-brain barrier. That means we were trying to chase the mercury out of the brain in a completely unnatural way. Yeah? We were trying to chase it in a way that it didn't get in there. And so I've been thinking about that for many years and said, well, it gets in there through the nerves. So when we want to put a detox agent on board to chase the mercury out of the brain, we have to put it in through the nerves. And so what we did, you know, we inject the DMPS or other detox agents uh, into the endings of the nerves, just like where the mercury got gobbled up. We put the DMPS there, and lo and behold, the, the DMPS is taken up by the nerve ending. It travels up to the spinal cord and to the brain within 24 to 48 hours and ends up complexing the mercury in the brain within 48 hours or so, getting it very nicely out of the brain. That's something um, we can trace by using our autonomic response testing. Um, there's a guy in, uh, in Seattle who does uh, MRI resonance testing. That's a new thing in medicine now that you can actually diagnose with the MRI the resonances of different substances, and they're finding the same thing. So we're getting the first signs of confirmation that I'm right with that. And the, the thing is that when you look at the bone cavitations, um, how, how does the brain get toxic? Well, one of the ways we know the brain gets toxic from mercury fillings, but from all other materials in the mouth as well, is, uh, le let me show you this now with the drawing. So here's your, your brain, and off the brain, hanging like little hoses. Yeah, you look like a medusa. Yeah, are the cranial nerves. Yeah, and the cranial nerves, uh, like if you take the fifth cranial nerve, um, where does it end? You know, down here. Yeah, we're inside a tooth. Yeah, at the ending here. And if you have like your, your silver fillings here and your other stuff, you know, it enters the jawbone around here, surrounding here. And the, the metals to start with traveled up. You now, there is a Swedish study on the hypoglossus nerve on the tongue. You know, your tongue is constantly bathed in a, a mercury uh, solution. And the mercury enters the tongue very easily and travels up in the hypoglossus nerve. So let's put the tongue here. Oh, well, it looks like a tongue almost. OK, so now it's a tongue. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the, here's the mercury particles that kind of impregnate the tongue. <laughs> and they very easily travel now up without any barrier. So they move up without any barrier into the brain and end up in the brain in a direct way, you know. And then all these other researchers in the world are all looking for how can we, you know, how can we bombard the brain, you know, with these substances that kind of, if you give them high enough, you know, they may cross in here and then get to the mercury. But that was stupid, you know. So what we do, we put a little bit DMPS here, and within a very few short period of time, the MPS is going to travel up here, complex the mercury, make it water soluble, make it so it can cross the blood brain barrier, and it comes out very playfully and easily. And uh, spurned by the research from Dr. Umura, let me talk a little bit about Dr. Umura. Uh, Dr. Umura has become one of my new heroes in medicine. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Yoshiaki Umura lives in New York. He is, by training, I believe, a surgeon. Turned it off. He turned it off. Oh. So he's a surgeon, and he's the editor of a journal. It's a peer-reviewed journal on acupuncture and electrotherapeutics research. And he published, since about 10 years, um, articles on what he calls a bi-digital O-ring test, which is nothing else but a form of muscle testing. However, all the studies are controlled and blinded and stuff. So there is a whole body of peer review research on using uh, one form of muscle testing, at least, 
And he had uh, discovered like uh, two years ago through an accident really uh, that uh, cilantro, Chinese parsley, has tremendous properties in detoxing the brain directly. And uh, he went this way with it. I really have to say, so to admit, he kind of stole this idea. And we have like a, a couple of people that made us cilantro in various forms and we tried it out. And my idea was this idea. I wanted to get the cilantro on the tongue <laughs> and we are the hypoglossus nerve and we are absorption through the mouth to the brain the quickest way I could. And one way of crossing things across the blood-brain barrier is alcohol. Yeah, anything almost that you put into alcohol ends up in the brain because alcohol has a high affinity for the brain, like some of you may have found out at one point in your life or another. <laughs> so, <coughs> so we made a, a tincture of cilantro, uh, which has a remarkable b the effect of being in the brain virtually within minutes after giving it and detoxing the brain. And so by, by adding that into our detox program, we have almost have gotten away from using the DMPS, which was the original bright idea that I had by putting it uh, injecting in the teeth, in the gums, in the end points of the cranial nerves to get it up in the brain. We're still doing that, but less. And the cilantro has much taken uh, uh, that place, uh, the tincture of cilantro. Um, the, um, the, the address where we're getting that is in the handout you know, that Carol is selling for five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it has the whole program in it. We, uh, it doesn't say the dosage of the cilantro. It's usually 10 drops twice a day. It takes very little to get the dentist's brain back to function. Now, <laughs> um, <laughs> now I, can, I can talk with authority on this. People always ask me, well, you hardly see any, pa you see only five patients a day, and how can you, you know, or, 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 you know. And the thing is, I have in Germany now, we have about 2,000 doctors in Germany um, that I've trained very well and carefully. They attend all the seminars. They kind of, the Germans, like you know, they're a little bit sort of the follower types. You know, sort of, and they kind of follow my uh, my word very religiously. I'm glad you're not doing that, you know. But on one other hand, it makes me sad sometimes too. I wish you would follow a little bit more. But <laughs> but so I have like over there, um, in m amongst that group, probably a hundred hardcore hitting people who see 20, 30 patients a day who follow me very closely. And uh, what they found is like now a large number of reports. Like you know, one that very touched me very much was a a kid that had seizures from the second year on of life, daily seizures, severe seizures, gone mild seizures, with biting his tongue, peeing in the pants. He was now 14 years old, so it was 12 years of seizures. He got his first dose of cilantro and never had a seizure again. You know, and that was like, you know, it was eight months ago, so we assume that that's gonna stay like that. We had lots of dentists, you know, who had insomnia, who could never sleep at night. You know, that they slept two, three hours, if that, and couldn't sleep. From the first day they took the cilantro, they had deep sleep every night. Uh, things like that, we've never seen that before. Yeah? We've never had a thing like that before, we've never seen that before. Chronic pain patients with uh, fibromyalgia and so forth. Uh, let's hold back on the questions until, until the end. I just kind of try to, try to make a point here. So, um, what, what we've been doing now, understanding the solvent issue. Now, solvents, uh, and insecticides, pesticides, um, are obviously complicating the healing in the jawbone, to say the least. Yeah? Most of you can follow my, my talk here, but understand that if you have a lake of solvents in the jawbone, uh, by taking out, by, by doing the bone cavitation surgery, um, yes, we're eliminating some bad tissue there, but we still have a huge residue there. Plus, now, and this is the point I'm trying to make about this brain. Imagine the whole brain being full of insecticides, pesticides, and metals. When you take out that little tooth at the end, now let's make it a tooth again, what looks like a tongue, yeah? You take that thing out, plus a jawbone around it, there's still a whole storage site up here, and it's gonna run down the cranial nerves until it's pumped out all the gunk. And Downward says it took him 25 to 30 surgeries to get to that end point. However, this MS patient got well. Uh, he wasn't one of the ones that kind of had the temporary improvement for a week and then relapsed. That's usually what we see. You know, if you see that, if you did a MS patient or any pain patient that got well for a couple of days and then they relapsed, you have that phenomenon going on. And you know, like uh, Chris knows, you know, so you have to go and reoperate, and you have to go and reoperate, and you have to go and reoperate. Now, however, you know, I figured, well, this is not elegant. So <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is, 
this is where Ara came in with his David then and said, shit, you know, if the stuff is running down there, you know, I mean, like, I, I, I just used my example. I had a, a, like most of you, had a time period where I was driving an old Volkswagen and uh, it was leaking in water from everywhere, you know, through the windows, through the doors and everywhere. So there was water always filling up and I was in Germany and I knew my car was going to rust away before the engine would break. And uh, so what did I do? I took my drill and drilled a few holes in the bottom and then didn't have the problem anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and when, uh, <laughs> and I remembered that when Ara, Ara and I sort of, Ara discovered the Stabidon procedure and that he read the uh, dental journal and we were going up skiing in Whistler and he kind of showed me the the ad, you know, and he hadn't done anything with it yet, and I looked at the ad, and I looked at him, and we both understood in a moment that we've uh, discovered something of the size of the nuclear bomb, you know, uh, just kind of by reading the ad and understanding it. And so what we're doing now, instead of reoperating these things, we punch uh, a number of little holes, you know, in the cavitation, just like I did with my car. So uh, to vent the area, with the idea of venting it, plus it allows us to put the antitoxins in there that we think we need. Now, um, uh, the antitoxins that we found are these. One, for the metal issue, DMPS is a universal detox agent. And I think the trick that Chris told us yesterday by adding in a little bit of EDTA, I think is very, very valuable, and we should all uh, be starting to do that. Uh, secondly, the universal way um, all, all of you know the sentence from chemistry, from basic chemistry, uh, likes uh, so, uh, dissolve likes. Yeah? If you want to dissolve vitamin A, don't use water, yeah? use oil. It dissolves nicely in olive oil, but it doesn't dissolve in or water. So solvents and insecticides and pesticides, they're all similar chemicals, dissolve very nicely in solvents. And the universal solvent that we're using is DMSO. It is the solvent that dissolves all the other ones and gets them out of the body in a very elegant <coughs> way. DMSO, for those of you who don't know what it is, is dimethyl sulfoxide. It's basically the juice, the blood of a tree. Yeah? It com comes from a paper mill in Louisiana. When they press the trees, you know, the juice that comes out, that concentrated and filtered uh, is DMSO. So DMSO is not a chemical compound. It is a naturally occurring solvent in nature that has tremendous beneficial effects. I heard yesterday for the first time somebody <coughs> mentioned they have seen one allergic reaction to it, um, which uh, surprised me, but you know, ideally use autonomic response testing to determine it. So our mix, what we put in these holes now, when you punch a hole in these things, um, uh, we, we use usually about two cc's per stabidens uh, um, drilling site that we have. You know, and, and these two cc's I put a quarter cc uh, DMPS, quarter to half a cc DMPS. I put a half a cc of DMSO and the rest of local anesthetic. So it ends up being about 0.5% local anesthetic solution. You don't want to go stronger than that because you, all the stuff you put in the tooth is going to end up in the brain, often within seconds, sometimes within minutes. And um, if you put too much, too strong local anesthetic there, you can get a seizure. I've never seen it, but be aware of that. Uh, in that area, it's nice to just have a end up with a 0 0.5 to you know 0.75, little stronger than 0.5, solution. Peter, mm -hmm. do, you, do you put any EDTA in there also? Well, I will from here on. I haven't done it, but it makes a lot of sense to me. How much do you think you use? It's very small. Qu quarter cc, an eighth, eighth of a cc, or quarter cc. Okay. I've injected into my mouth and stuff, and okay. if you have an open nerve, you'll feel that. Okay. Just a little bit. Uh, eighth of a cc, just right. a drop. <laughs> yeah, but uh, two cc's. Now, if if the if your drilling site is good, usually the tooth you can put an infusion there. You can put a hang an infusion set on the stabident needle, and the jawbone will take up endless amounts of fluid. I tried it on myself. You know, we put in twenty cc's of fluid into the jawbone gradually, because it was taken up nicely. So it, it is, um, unless you're in a confined space, which you find out because if you inject, after a while it stops, it just doesn't take anymore, then you stop, you don't push it. Yeah? 
But if it, if it takes it, we give two cc's of fluid. Uh, uh, two cc's to three cc's are usually enough to numb an entire quarter of the mouth uh, if there's free flow of local anesthetic and, and solution. Uh, let's hold back on the, on the other question because I want to make another point now. However, look at this drawing here. The main depot of mercury, of palladium, of all the crap that we have in the mouth, uh, a small portion is in the brain. And that's a portion that gives us all the, the, the Parkinson, the tremor, the shakes, the insomnia, the depression, the, mute, the mood swings, the, the sexual disinterest that many, many uh, dentists uh, have, things like that. However, uh, much of the pain, of the body pain caused by mercury is referred pain from the sinuses. The maxillary sinus relates to your gut and to all structures in the spine. And if you have a patient with chronic pain, or chronic gut problems, food allergies, food sensitivities, malabsorption of any sort. Uh, usually the key is the maxillary sinus, which is full of this, uh, I don't know how you even call it, it's like the bottom of the lake, this kind of yucky, icky stuff. And you can, uh, wh what do you call it? Sludge. Sludge. That was the word I was looking for. Thanks. Um, and to get the sludge out, we have now a, a simple procedure that works and that is dynamite. And what that is, is an offshoot of Thomas Rouse. Uh, he, he taught me this, his physical therapist actually did, who learned this. You have the patient uh, lying on the table, his head hanging over the edge so that the nostrils face the ceiling. In this situation, <coughs> when you drip in any fluid in the nostril, it ends up in the maxillary sinus. So we have an easy access and no needle, no injection access to the maxillary sinus. And what I do, I draw up a 10 cc syringe. Um, I usually want to end up with about 8 cc total volume. And in this solution, I draw up half a cc DMPS, 1 cc of DMSO. I add in uh, the Sanum remedies. Now, I haven't talked about the Sanum remedies yet, but um, th it's not a Sanum course. But there's three ones that are the winners for chronic infections. Um, which are always accompanying. We have all the studies that show if there's mercury or palladium or nickel, you're going to have infections because the immune system is going to be so repressed in the area that anything grows in this area. And to treat the infection, you can treat the infection forever without getting rid of it, but you take the metals out and then it takes very little to treat the infection and get rid of it. So we use a mix of the three anti-infectious sanum remedies, which is notochiel, fotochiel, and pefrochiel. Doug, would you mind writing those names down so I don't have to spell them here? So there's the, there's the three main ones. So we draw those up. And again, I, I go off a 2% procaine solution. Then we use procaine to make the, the final solution about a quarter percent procaine solution. Again, you don't want to put 1% procaine or 2% procaine in the sinuses because most of it ends up in the brain within minutes. And uh, you can get a patient so high that they think they're on an overdose of cocaine. <laughs> so I use a I end up with a quarter percent solution. Yeah? So um, that means when I go off a, a two percent uh, lidocaine, I use about one cc, two percent uh, no cane in eight cc's of fluid, and the rest is these other things that I draw up. Then I dribble that slowly you know, in the patient's nostril. Solution, over solution, uh, saline? Yeah, uh, well, uh, I usually don't need, if you don't have the sanum remedies, you use saline solution to make up for the difference of the volume. Most important is the DMPS and the DMSO. Then you drip that in there. Let it in there and then let the patient sit up, let them blow their nose, some of it will come out, most of it will stay in the sinus, get absorbed through the sinus membranes, and now all hell breaks loose. Yeah, you have to fasten your seat belts, <laughs> stand back and see what happens over the next few days. Usually what happens, is that the patient goes on now to develop full-blown <coughs> the symptoms of acute heavy metal toxicity, depending on what's in their sinuses. And let me read you, I brought you like a little excerpt from an old homeopathic book. Now, um, the, the best way to learn about metal toxicity is getting yourself in bookstores like some of the old homeopathic texts. What they did, they fed people doses of cadmium and they simply observed 
what kind of symptoms did they develop? And then they listed those down. Yeah? And here's like just one of the books um, on mercury, yeah, one of the toxicology texts, homeopathic toxicology texts, lists on head symptoms. Now I like this one because it's short and it has a lot of goodies in it. Vertigo associated with stumbling or swaying is especially noticed on rising from bed or from sitting. No, some of you dentists here will say, oh my God, that's me. <laughs> Headache is severe, the whole head is tender to the touch, feels compressed as if in a vice, or it may feel as if growing larger or being pressed on from above, that's me. My head always growing larger. <laughs> Boring pains occur in the head, notably in the left temple or occiput. Headache is worse at night or on waking but better when up and moving around. Hair tends to fall out. <laughs> the scalp is extremely itchy. There's me again. Now here comes one about the bone cavitation. That's why I'm reading this. It's the last line of this one. Skull bones. Now the old homeopathics included the jaw in the skull bones. Skull bones necrose. I mean, can you have a better description of a necro lesion? Skull bones necrose as a sign of mercury toxicity. So. Those of you, you know, it's very difficult to f go through any of the modern toxicology texts and find out how the hell does mercury toxicity look like, because now they're feeding it to animals and watching animals, where it says Hanuman, in 1600 something, he fed mercury to himself and the whole family, uh, all of his children, his wife and everybody, and observed the changes and wrote them down. And what better symptom description can we have than those? That was from, from Hanuman. Um, okay, now, I don't know. Is my time up or? Hmm? <laughs> well, uh, they gave small doses of this. Yes, they survived it, you know. Um, okay, um, let me see what else I wanted to do. <laughs> oh, um, about once every two weeks. Until they stop reacting. Yeah, usually you have to then uh, clean up the patient when hell, all hell breaks loose. They have to be on the oral detox program. Again, it's five bucks at the exit. <laughs> um, let me see what else I want to, to, to tell you. Oh, yeah, one of the things I started putting in there again is Hal Huggins old uh, PZI, protamine zinc insulin. Um, insulin uh, has very overlapping um, uh, characteristics with growth, human growth hormone. And it turns on uh, the, the, the bone growth in the area. Um, lately, a group in Germany that works with me have uh, started using growth hormone. And those of you who are uh, interested in using growth hormone, I can give you the dose what we put in the jawbone there. It's you take a, a four unit vial, the com growth hormone comes in four unit vials, and uh, uh, you draw that up and give uh, one tenth of that. Um, uh, in, into the stabidant side uh, with the jawbone. And that's supposedly the most outstanding, amazing, miracle healing that happens when you do that. I used to use uh, PZI because it's much cheaper. You can get it through college pharmacy or apothecure. Um, uh, it costs close to nothing. Use three units of it and put that in there. It's very cheap, inexpensive, and really turns on the healing in the jawbone uh, in a way that we haven't seen before. But the, the growth hormone is, is a definite winner. So I add that into my mix when I inject into the jawbone. That was one thing I want to let you know. Um, uh, now, uh, growth hormone can be uh, argumented with certain amino acids. Uh, my favorite one is glutamine. You know, give the patient 10 grams of glutamine a day while they're healing from the cavitation surgery. That's a big dose, and it works. It's, it's tremendous how it speeds up the, the healing after, after these surgeries. Um, oh yeah, little axiom from Dandera. Dandera has shown very conclusively, you cannot store metals in your brain <coughs> without being allergic to them, and vice versa. You cannot detox the brain completely without desensitizing the patient to the metals. So we have a procedure uh, it's very easy to learn, fairly easy to learn, uh, how to desensitize people towards the metals. 
Doug Phillips has a version of that, and Doug is teaching courses uh, in his clinic, uh, teaching this procedure. Anne, Anne lifts your hand. Anne is, uh, in my opinion, the foremost practitioner of what I've been teaching over the years. She is the only person that I know of who's putting it all together in this country. The dentistry approach and the, the muscle testing and the neural therapy and stuff. And Anne is teaching courses um, on that with, with her staff, you know, who knows uh, all, the, all the secrets of that. But remember, if you want to detox somebody, you have to desensitize, find out what metal they're allergic to, desensitize uh, them to them, and the metals start marching out uh, almost on their own with very little, little help from our side. There was uh, another one. Let me look at my notes. What else is there? Oh, yeah. I was supposed to lecture on the relationship between the teeth uh, and the rest of the body. Now, this relationship, the dental chart um, that uh, is available uh, through Ed here, uh, they have a, a nice dental chart that shows which tooth relates to what area in the body. Uh, Christine Jackson, uh, Thomas Rao has translated the chart. The problem uh, with the chart is that they're all based on electroacupuncture, um, a little pearl, because of the electroacupuncture uses a small current that is put in the measuring point. Um, Umura and others have shown uh, that it switches the meridians, it changes, the, it alters the autonomic nervous system that you're then trying to measure. So you're not measuring the nervous system as it is, but you're first changing the nervous system and then measure what you've changed it to. And so by using muscle testing and other techniques, we found that that crossing of the meridians doesn't really happen in the back teeth, like it's on all these charts, so all these charts are wrong. And the only right dental chart is the one that you can get from the American Academy of Neural Therapy. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, the posterior teeth are the uh, stomach, and, uh, <laughs> so stomach and spleen, and the, uh, the first and second <coughs> premolar um, is the colon and lung meridian. The crossing over doesn't happen. However, these are statistical likelihoods where, where things relate to, and you really need to go deeper and understand also the five element theory let me give you a little pearl on that one. Uh, we know that the front teeth should relate to the pelvic organs and to the kidneys, and you know the, the wisdom tooth area should relate um, to the heart and small intestine. However, as Chris yesterday pointed out, which he found, the prostate very often is the wisdom tooth. Well, how can that be? Because the, you know, it's not. But there is this relationship. You know, we uh, uh, in in acupuncture, uh, the five element theory. One is called the control cycle. And, and just one element in there that you all understand is that the element water, which is the kidney and bladder area, uh, the water element controls the fire element. Yeah? I mean, all of you know when you pee on a, on a fire, it goes out. When you put water on a fire, it goes out, right? I mean, we all agree on that. So that's called the, the control cycle. Water controls fire. So there is a relationship between the bladder kidney area and the... Uh, uh, and the uh, the heart, uh, small intestine, which is the wisdom tooth area. But it goes in this way that this tooth, you know, will be affecting this area. And then you have the cycle called the counteracting cycle, where you have exactly the opposite relationship, where the heart element, that means the wisdom tooth, uh, has an effect on the water element. Yeah? And so in this way, we understand how the wisdom tooth area can affect the prostate, because the prostate is on a bladder meridian and, and is affected by that. So. We have to really understand those relationships are not just a pure, straight relationship. So it doesn't often go, because it's a wisdom tooth area, it will affect the fire element, which is the heart, you know, create a dysrhythmia, which is the most common thing that we see from the wisdom tooth. Heart problems, you know, from unresolved issues in the, in the wisdom tooth area. But uh, it affects also the water element and others as well. There's <coughs> other cycles in acupuncture. So anything can really affect anything else. And that's why the autonomic uh, response testing is so important, you know, which is the type of muscle testing we do, or the electroacupuncture. Um, Doug Lieber is here. Doug, lift your hand up. Doug is teaching electroacupuncture, and he's to known many of, as of, of us as probably the most advanced American uh, teacher in electroacupuncture, uh, Don Bartram. Don, lift, lift your hand up. Uh, Don, uh, I've, uh, I had the opportunity to work with him here for six weeks. He is um, <coughs> the, uh, probably the most brilliant electroacupuncturist in terms of com getting, having reduced it in the, in the oral area to relating to the teeth, 
to to what works, what doesn't work, and he's worked out a program that's just dynamite. And I I hope that either you kind of team up sometime and teach a course together, or uh, you know I would love to bring Don here. You know maybe Ed can arrange that. I was totally impressed when I saw Don zip through this thing like in two minutes. You know, he had sorted that patient out and he knew where to hold the laser. Yeah, he used electroacupuncture to know where to hold the laser. And that's how he made the laser work, which then, you know, we tried it and we couldn't get it work because we didn't do the groundwork that he did. You know, and so uh, most of you can do miracles with a laser if you learn the miracle testing procedure. And uh, he's gone far beyond of what, you know, what I can do with the muscle testing because he spent you know years with Bolin. He spent years with all the other guys, and he spent years with himself, kind of thinking about stuff like some of us do occasionally. Okay, then um, that was the rela that's all I wanted to say about the relationships. Don't be fooled by the charts. The charts can be more misleading uh, than leading, but if you understand that they give you a statistical likelihood, the most likely connection is what you see on the chart, and then know that everything else is possible. Um, then you have a great guide. That's all I want to say about that. And then one last word. Uh, there's a company out there um, that has a table out in the exhibits. Uh, the product is called Remedium. Now, it may have gone unnoticed by many of us because these are very unassuming people <coughs> um, that, that have this company. Um, I can't really say where Remedium comes from, uh, but it comes from a very good source. But what it is is some Aldo sugars these are sugars that we know very little about uh, in a combination with vitamin C and niacin as a delivery system of how to get these sugars deep into the tissue. Um, uh, this substance has been the most potent treatment of fibromyalgia. If you know anybody who has fibromyalgia, usually it clears up within the first week of taking this stuff, no matter what the cause of the fibromyalgia is. It is very expensive, however, it is a production of the stuff that is extremely expensive. Um, we are using it for a lot of things um, that we're really not allowed to say what we're using it for. It's that bad C word yeah, that, that, <coughs> that we're using it for. It's fantastic if you have any patient uh, with one of the more severe stages of uh, an intractable illness. Um, you want to <laughs> you want to try this one and then some of us have done some things with it to uh, deepen the effect of it you can talk to me in the break about that um, but uh, don't let that go unnoticed um, but for now um, it, it does two things one everybody who takes it usually uh, experiences a tremendous increase in their well-being uh, and their energy level and then people that have chronic, hmm? a reme it's a company called Remedium, I believe. Huh? Yeah, it's it's made in our neck of the woods. Well, they have a table out there that's gonna, you know, just check uh, check up on on that. It is very expensive, but those of you who can afford to to try it out yourself, I would encourage you uh, uh, to give it a shot. Fibromyalgia, just to say a few things, you know, is like rampant right now, and it's kind of on the increase. Fibromyalgia is autonomic dysfunction, there's no doubt about that, always in conjunction with toxicity. So we used to treat fibromyalgia simply by detoxing patients with great results. But there's a subgroup, about one-third, that didn't do that well. And they do, just every case that I've had got well within a week, you know, on this stuff. And that's why I kind of asked the company to come here, uh, let people know that you're there, they're very cautious, you know, because of our friends in the government, uh, what they're saying, and you won't get any words out of, out of them. Uh, because they don't know who you are, you know. And so it's a matter of playing with it. You can talk to me. Uh, Carol Arana is a good uh, person to talk to about it. Um, that's our treatment for fibromyalgia. For those of you who have patients or chronic fatigue or um, the bad illnesses um, that have been difficult for all of us, it's, it's a great way to go. Um, uh, one uh, last pearl, and then take a few well questions. Being an energy goes up on the second one. Hmm? Huh? You started to say two things. Okay. No, that was the same thing. The first thing was well being and energy. And the second oh, yeah, fibromyalgia. Oh, that was the second thing. Yeah. Okay. So anything that looks like chronic fatigue or anything that looks like fibromyalgia responds usually fantastic to it. Um, um, 
I fitted one of our dinner friends here, uh, uh, who had a uh, reoccurrence of prostate cancer, very rapidly growing prostate cancer, and you put him on this stuff, and it was virtually within two weeks uh, was gone. You know, from from a biopsy proven tumor to a biopsy negative uh, tumor, and so it, it is really dynamite. It is expensive, but it's worthwhile paying attention to it. You know, so I, I won't. Hmm? Oh, they they say they they tell you how to use it. Yeah, okay. I actually don't know uh, what. A month, yeah. uh, uh, check with them. It depends on you know. I've been. Uh, uh, I, I live in Seattle, and actually, uh, a good friend, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, got into involved with the company, and actually, she supplied me for for my own use for the first three months. You know, on a trial basis, so I never had to pay for it. And my patients did, but I don't know what they paid. I honestly, don't know. Okay, um, let me just say one more, one more last private thing, and then I take a few questions uh, before we have the break. Am I scheduled to 9.30 or? Take as much time as you want. Hmm? Okay, okay. Um, <coughs> <laughs> one last thing, and then I take a few questions. Um, we, we organized some dolphin swims you know, where, we, um, where we go out in the waters of the Bahamas, spend a week on a boat, um, uh, with, with small groups of seven people uh, where we swim as good as we can every day uh, with wild dolphin and then experience whatever comes up. Uh, I'll put that out. Those of you who are interested in that or um, I would like to try that, um, you can talk to Loretta. She sits back there. Lift your hand up. Yeah. <laughs> um, we did that last year and it was very transformational for a lot of us um, to spend a week with dolphin. It's very special, and lots of things happen. You know, most of you have heard enough about it. So, okay. Uh, now, um, I know I've kind of been jumping around a little bit, but an hour and a half doesn't give me a lot of time. And I know I needed to fill in a lot of you guys. Um, I uh, maybe one last word. I still don't know how people ever can get somebody well in the jaw without using the Sanum remedies. I don't understand that some of you are so slow of catching on. Um, <laughs> We do have a handout, uh, you know, that Louisa created uh, a couple of years ago on how to use the Sanum remedies. Um, <coughs> Sanum is a strange company. You know, Christine Jackson is here. She's sort of the American uh, person of that company. Um, the company, unfortunately, I think uh, two years ago, that invited. No, this is not talking bad about you, but just a few details about the company. Two years ago, they invited me to speak in Germany. I thought I was going to lecture in front of a group of 20 people, and I come to this hotel. There's two and a half thousand people there, <laughs> and they kind of had them every hotel room. They kind of stacked people and had the, with videos, had them all hooked up and stuff. And uh, I was giving a lecture on how to use uh, the sound remedies in the mouth, and um, I got a standing ovation you know, from two and a half thousand people, and the whole hotel was kind of shaking, which was great. Um, <laughs> And the interesting thing was I never heard anything from the company again, not one word, a thank you letter or anything. <laughs> and then what I found out from the inside was, well, <coughs> you, did <coughs> <coughs> you, didn't <coughs> you didn't mention our microscopes when you were lecturing. <laughs> and it was like I was teaching people you know, how to use muscle testing to use the remedies. And um, uh, people were thrilled, but the company wasn't so thrilled because they sort of married uh, to Zeiss, you know, uh, manufacturing the microscopes. And uh, I really haven't been invited since then. Um, and the thing is, you know, sort of, we taught the Sanum company how to use the remedies in the mouth, you know, because the, uh, Dr. Isles was great yesterday. He, he cornered me and said, you know, the bone cavitations, that's TB in the mouth, that's TB in the mouth. And that's what we find over and over. It's the tubercular remedies in Sanum that test uh, uh, against these bone cavitations. And, uh, so we know, uh, in, in terms of using the remedies in the mouth, and especially in the stavident, dent, um, it's Doug Phillips, it's Anne McCombs, uh, you know, who works with Laval Reinecke, who is a brilliant dentist in Seattle. It's me, it's Louisa Williams. Louisa Williams really kind of who's been all our teacher uh, in, in the use of these remedies in the mouth. And uh, those of you who want to learn how to use them, you know, take a course, either an autonomic response testing with me or neural kinesiology with Louisa. Um, this is sort of, we, we're sort of the group who pioneered uh, this work. 
uh, going back to the literature in Germany from the 1930s and 40s, there was a guy called Van Appel uh, who uh, wrote the first papers on using the sound remedies in the mouth. He was doing the same thing. He was drilling holes in the jawbone, sticking a remedy in there. And, uh, and unfortunately, the company has forgotten that, and they're still teaching the use of pefrakil and some of the weaker remedies. We introduced them to the use of alkylan A, those of you who don't know, in the jawbone. At the time, when I first lectured on it four or five years ago, uh, one of the company representatives in Germany uh, came up to me and said, we never heard that, and that can't be, you know, the alkylan A is a weak remedy, and it kind of, you know, we use it for arthritis and, you know, and stuff. And so, but since then, now they're preaching it all, and there's an all that uh, text and stuff again. Hmm? Yeah, I know. No, no, Chris. Oh, yeah, no, no. Christine is a, a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful lady, and she's done much more. Actually, the Sanum remedy, which is interesting, you know, w the Sanum company was from what I hear dying in Germany until we <laughs> Americans picked this up, uh, thanks to this lady, and we kind of created a lot of energy in the company. And then some of us, me and a few others, uh, mentioned dropped it over there. And the Germans, you know, when you're an American, you come over there and you just drop the word. They kind of, they think they suddenly, you know, discovered gold, <laughs> you know, and they kind of all jumped on it. And actually, the company was kind of dipping. And since uh, Christine picked up the the remedies over here, and it started going up here, now it's going gung ho in Europe. But it's only because of the impact that we silently <laughs> had, you know, many of us had uh, over in Germany. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, but that's uh, ju just a few things. Now I'll take a few questions, yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, sinus drip, would you ever use that if you had not already removed all of the metal um, in the tooth? Yeah. Uh, the one precaution is I never use any detox procedures in patients that still have exposed surfaces of amalgam. However, if it's other metals or if the amalgam is under fillings, it's kind of concealed and only slowly leaking, I use all these detox measures on those people. There was a, a question there first. You described the, the method of detoxifying the brain in the cavitation or the extraction site. What about if you're just removing the mercury and how it's getting into the detox a patient? Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's in my $5 protocol. But let me just co show you one more overhead uh, to that. <laughs> Protocol is not in the back. It's going to get to give it from the desk of the American Academy of Biological Dentistry. It's at the book table. So that's that detox protocol that Dietrich's talking about is at the table over here inside the uh, exhibit hall. <coughs> oh. Okay, um, what this is, uh, for the first time we managed uh, in Germany now to find a lab who can test mercury and other metals in the stool. And uh, many of you have learned from me the use of chlorella for detoxing the patient. And uh, we did uh, stools on several patients before uh, chlorella and after chlorella. And uh, before chlorella, there's very little metals in the stool. Now this one here is two aftershots. One has uh, aluminum, 15,000 micrograms of uh, aluminum in the stool coming out. Lead is 360, and tin is 310. These are all toxic metals which are excreted in huge doses. Um, and we, uh, we checked before, we checked after. Before, these values are all <coughs> below 100. I don't have the before uh, overheads with me. We're measuring uh, metals in the shed. <laughs> <laughs> Dino, Dino's Greek, he didn't understand the word stool, so. <coughs> <coughs> okay, so here's another measurement, you know, where we uh, find uh, 51 micrograms uh, per kilogram of stool uh, in, the, in, the, in the stool. Yeah, which is the first proof 
that we have that what we've been preaching for five or six years, you know, that chlorella is fantastic in detoxing the patient. Um, and we have now, you know, lots of stool uh, studies over, over in Germany. We did not find a lab in the U.S. who could test metals in the stool. I don't know why that is. The detox. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we've we've shown you know, in the. Uh huh. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, in the article actually uh, that I've written uh, that you're all going to buy for five dollars when you go out, right at the exit. <laughs> It actually establishes the link between metals and uh, parasites. Yeah, that's sort of the whole uh, tone of the article. But it has a whole program for the dentist in there, how to use the natural substances, and how to protect your patients while they're going through the dentistry, and how to detox them without uh, using the DMPS, without using any of the things that are outside your license. So that was one of the inclinations of the article. Is there still mercury in 20-year-old uh, amalgams? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it, it really shouldn't use DM. Are there studies that show that DMPS really does go into saliva? Um, there is a, a lot of clinical evidence of those who've done enough DMPS tests and enough DMPS shots on people with amalgam in the mouth. Uh, I've seen one seizure after it. I've seen a lot of headaches and terrible mental symptoms after it. However, unfortunately, Paula Bickel has now arranged with the FDA a study that they divided in two groups. One group where they use DMPS on people with amalgam fillings. And I'm very worried about this study because I know they're going to have a lot of complications. And the FDA is going to then say, well, because of these complications, DMPS is not a safe drug, so we have to take it off the market. And Paula, Paula has arranged for that now, fully knowing uh, that this is going to happen. And I don't understand it, but this is the way of the world. It, it has never been a very intelligent place. And uh, <laughs> so don't, don't, don't use it. You know, you can use it once on t on a patient with amalgam fillings. You're going to get away with that. It's usually the second or third shot where the trouble begins to happen. If you go beyond that, big trouble is going to happen. Uh, where was a, a question back there? Yeah. Yes, um, I had a question about the jawbone, regrowing the jawbone. Yes. Um, I had two questions. One is, have you ever looked at clodronate? And the other is, um, how do you use the insulin? I, I wasn't. Oh, um, Ara is going to introduce us uh, later today uh, in the Stabilent uh, procedure. Uh, and we inject it into the jawbone. We make a little hole in the jawbone and then take a 29 gauge or 30 gauge needle, insert it in that hole, and then squirt the medicine in the jawbone. That's where you put the three units of PZI, or, or polymer zinc insulin, along with the DMPS and DMSO and local anesthetic and the sound remedies. Yeah? Yeah, in the jawbone, the most common one testing is alpha-keylon A, yeah, but it can be nigasan, it can be one of the others. Usually it's a combination of uh, two or three that test in the jawbone. But the most common one, if you don't test, is alpha-keylon A. Uh, the other question was Oh, uh, yeah, sorry, the name, name has changed. Uh, okay, what? Pleo mook. Okay, Pleo Arthro A is going to be the name. Okay, I'm glad you changed the names, by the way, because these other names, the Keelan, you know, Keelbeck is the name of the guy, you know. So he has his ego in every one of the remedies. Every time you inject, you inject his ego a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Love it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, uh, no. Uh, it is best to use the sound remedies without local anesthetics. We found that uh, even just adding procaine or lidocaine to it, it weakens uh, the remedies to some degree. However, since the intervention is relatively great, you know, we're putting a hole in the jawbone. We want to. We find that the loss of effectiveness of the remedy is justified by the benefits of the other ingredients that you put in there. And if you use the MPS you should always put local anesthetic on board with it. 
as a carrier of substance to carry it into the nervous system. And we found that by adding in a local anesthetic, it makes the DMPS pass uh, into the nervous system very easily. So you have to wait again. So usually you will end up doing a mix the first time. You now, the other thing with the stabidend, and Ara is going to point out, don't do one stabidend and if it doesn't work or if the patient only improves a little bit, you stop. Remember the <coughs> 25 or 30 surgeries, it may take 25 to 30 stabidend procedures to get the patient well. But that is then that they're out of the wheelchair and it is then that they have a life again. And it, once you're a dentist and can do this procedure, it takes you nothing to drill a hole in there and, and inject. It's a no-brainer. It's easy. It's not a, you know, it's a, a light procedure. But it will take a number of times of doing this procedure. It's not a, a, a quick fix. It's quick fix uh, diagnostic. <coughs> and Ara is going to talk to m us more about that. Uh, 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 you already had your turn, Mike. Here, the, the lady, yeah, with the black, yeah. Uh, you have mentioned the example of the child who had seizures that responded to the mm -hmm. um, tincture. In a child that started seizures too, you would presume that it wouldn't have more severe form of amalgam. And you also made a connection between the macular design and the connection mm -hmm. of the sludge there. Mm -hmm. In children, at least in this country, you have very high incidence of chronic infection, of chronic infection. Yeah. Well, the answer to it is the mother. It's the mother. Yeah. Uh, we assume that about uh, up to 60 percent of the uh, body burden of mercury passes uh, with the firstborn child uh, into the firstborn child. You know, through a combination of trans placenta uh, transport and in the mother's milk. Mother's milk is one of the most toxic substances there ever was. If the mother has had a history of amalgam fittings, which all of our mothers had. And then uh, what happens is, is twofold. One, the child gets a load of mercury with all the symptoms and the ear infections. Well, it, it goes really indirectly. Because of the mercury burden, uh, the growth of the, the cranial bone doesn't happen in a proper way because uh, the DNA uh, template you know, can't be read properly. And so you get all this misconfiguration of you know, the small, you know, the jaw and the, the, the your stachian tube isn't open so you don't get the ventilation of the ear and then all the dental stuff comes in where you can have to structurally actually fix this. That, that's one component that you get the side effects of the mercury, but also these children lose their ability to detox uh, mercury. Basically, they, it, it's a program in the subconscious. Everything that comes from the mother must be good. And if it's mercury coming, uh, mercury gets affiliated with something that's nurturing and good, and the body loses the ability to detox it. And we have to basically break that apart and uh, we do that with the Nambudipas allergy elimination technique, the Anne is teaching, that uh, Doug is teaching. Um, I'm teaching it occasionally, but we've got excellent teachers of that. So <laughs> children are just affected by the mercury issue when they never had any mercury, any obvious contact, never ate fish out of a can, but they all had a mother. So we have to look at the mother. And if you don't look at the mother, you still have to look at the father. He doesn't pass any mercury onto the child but he passes on the inability to detox mercury. Yeah? We found that very, uh, very clearly, and there's evidence in the literature now for that. Oh, okay, I, I'll take just one more question, and then we kind of uh, go on. Okay. You're going to speak about the uh, poor man's laser. The poor man's laser is, yeah, okay. That brings me back to Dr. Yoshi Aki Omura, who is really <coughs> one of the remaining few genius people in the world. And Christina, would you, would you raise your hand? Um, <laughs> uh, Christina is a dentist from New York who's worked quite a bit with Dr. Omura. And then Ted, where's Ted? Ted, stand up when you're there. Okay, yeah, can I stand up? I recommend, yeah, I recommend uh, all of you who are interested in talking to these guys about Dr. Omura. Yeah, uh, she's going to write Dr. Omura's phone number on here. Dr. Omura teaches a 300 hour acupuncture <coughs> program in New York to MDs. Uh, that means you get a license to practice acupuncture, but not only that, these courses are AMA Category 1 approved, and he teaches the O-ring test. And the O-ring test, therefore, has become the first defendable form of muscle testing uh, in the medical community, and I recommend all of you take as <coughs> many courses with him as you can. He's brilliant. He has figured out a way to treat cancer. He has made incredible strides of using muscle testing uh, as, as a diagnostic phase to diagnose all kinds of things 
that we couldn't diagnose before. He goes far beyond of what was possible with electroacupuncture. Like he can outline a tumor on the skin now, tell exactly where the extent of the tumor is. He can grade it, stage it, um, and he has figured out a program to treat cancer in a fantastic way. He, I discovered him because of the heavy metal thing. Everything he, he found all this stuff with mercury, you know, the mercury cancer link that I've been talking about, and suddenly I wasn't alone anymore. It was somebody else coming from a similar angle, finding the same thing. So, um, yeah, and he found that a mag light, a mag flashlight, uh, is often enough to carry uh, homeopathic information into the patient. Yeah, that means we we have a uh, way I developed in autonomic response testing that is fantastic, and where we use a mirror to invert the patient's own frequencies back onto him, and we piggyback uh, the healing remedies into that, and use a mag light simply to amplify the effect. But it all goes back to Dr. Omura's uh, research. He's uh, the, the first one, like one study he did uh, with the University of Tokyo. Now, he has a university, I have Germany, he's got the University of Tokyo kind of uh, backing up some of his research and doing some of the footwork for him. Um, they found, uh, for example, we were always looking, you know, in muscle testing, we put a substance on the body, you know, how can the substance possibly have an effect and change something? And he proved that if you, uh, uh, in the energy field of the person, uh, hold a, a tiny light that the patient can't see, that's even so weak that you can't see it visibly, uh, that there is a, a signal, a clear signal in the pons area in the brain um, that is receiving the signal. So there is uh, proof now that tiny electromagnetic signals in the energy field of the body have a tremendous effect on the brain, changing the, the wiring in the brain. And he did that single-handedly. I mean, this guy is amazing. And he publishes a paper, comes out every two months or so. His charts with the mask. His charts, yeah, the hand chart. Like, he uses a technique called drug uptake enhancement. That means, and, and I've been using this concept, and that's one thing I'd like to maybe give you as a last thing. When we treat somebody, for example, with DMPS, the DMPS is going to go everywhere except where the mercury is. Now, why is that? Mercury creates a sympathetic hyperactivity that creates vasoconstriction. That means the area where the mercury is are going to be the vasoconstricted area with poor blood flow. And the only place where the, where the DMPS isn't going is where it's supposed to go. Right? I mean, you can follow. Same with cancers. That's why chemotherapy doesn't work. Yeah? And that's why in medicine the term drug uptake enhancement has become a big word. Um, uh, in Germany we're using hyperthermia that actually Dr. Issels was one of the, the pioneers of. For example, if you want to uh, treat the prostate, we inject uh, a anti-cancer drug that's specific for the prostate. <coughs> However, before that, you put a catheter in the bladder that has a little coil in the prostate area, and the coil gives off a, a radio signal that heats up the tissue to 46 degrees centigrade, and the prostate heats up, and now we give the chemotherapy. And the chemotherapy is going to preferentially go to the area where the cancer is, where otherwise you would have given toxic doses of chemotherapy to get anything in there at all. You can now give very small doses. They're going to accumulate there. Dr. Omura found, hey, we don't need to use hyperthermia. He found like about a zillion other ways of increasing the uptake. And one of the simplest one is the uh, acupressure. By, by having outlined, out mapped the exact areas on the hand that relate to the prostate and to the breast, the right breast, left breast, and you know exactly where the area is, you can simply several times a day massage the area. And he's proven in blinded studies that that increases the blood uptake in the organ with where the, the medication should go. So I've been playing with that, with the DMPS, to get it in the brain. You massage the brain area on the, on the hand several times a day. On the day when you give the DMPS, you're going to get a much higher uptake of the DMPS in the brain. Uh, the easy way for those of you who have done neural therapy with me is to do segmental therapy over the organs. If you want to have DMPS, go to the brain. You do a crown of thorns. Yesterday I learned a new term for the crown of thorns from Dr. Issel. It's called now Corona Christi. At least <laughs> 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 I think it's a nicer word. And so you do a Corona Christi. If you wanted to go to the sinuses, you do the sinus injection. If you wanted to go to the kidneys, uh, you do segmental therapy over the kidneys and so forth. And I've shown you overheads in my courses that we already know that that works. So. You can do segmental therapy over the organ. You can use acupressure. However, Omura proved that most of the acupressure charts are copies of somebody else's acupressure chart who copied it of somebody else, who copied it of somebody else, 
And the research is missing on the relationships. And most acupressure charts are fairly close to the truth, but far enough away so it never works. So Dr. Omura has re redone all the testing on the reflex zones, on the hand, on the feet, and on other areas of the body, and has the charts available. And um, you know, that's Ed a can carry them. Ed, Ed can carry yeah, them. We, we can ask uh, Ed Orana to carry them in his institute here, right. or you call that phone number. And I recommend all of you reach out to that. That is one of the few people, he's not going to live that much longer the way he lives and runs his life. He's not going to be around that long. So don't miss him. Yeah. Don't miss him. Yeah. Can you mention something about the internet mirror? Thanks. Yeah, I, I can't get into that, into that detail. One last thing I wanted to point out. Uh, my former microscopist and friend, uh, Darkfield microscopist in Santa Fe, Caroline Hamburger, is here. And since, yeah, and since um, I'm a one-man show now, which I really enjoy, I'm not having any uh, uh, employees or anybody working with me. I'm just me, and, and I love it. Uh, Caroline is out of work, and uh, she put a little job application there. And those of you, you know, who have interest in uh, having a dark field person work with you, uh, even just for a while, you know, talk to her. That's her. Michael Gerber. Okay, last question. When do you use D-penicillamine, and what <coughs> what indications? Do you test okay. with it as a challenge, and yeah. if you gave it therapeutically, how often? Okay. okay. Well, I just started using D-Pen as an alternative to DMPS. Uh, D-Penicillamine is a legal drug, it's a PDR. Uh, it is a powerful detox agent for, uh, for mercury. I've only used it so far for the tests, following Russell Jaffe's uh, protocol uh, for it. And uh, do you have, do you have uh, Russell's phone number? And they very, uh, very freely send you uh, their protocol that they've been using. Um, I have right now. Uh, somebody custom compound for me an injectable D-penicillamine uh, since I'm uh, seeing clouds over the DMPS guy. Um, uh, I know that D-penicillamine is very safe to inject. It's been around as an injectable and was taken off the market because nobody was using it. It's very powerful of using it in neural therapy. I played with it in Germany. It's still available there. It's fantastic. And so um, I just, you know, try to open the channel so if the FDA or the government or Paula or somebody is um, making a mistake, you know, and, and it won't be available, so we have an alternative, you know. <laughs> but I've, like I said, the neural therapy and the natural detox program that, that uh, we have developed is, is so potent um, and safe that we don't need that much more. And now with Dr. Umura's uh, contributions, um, we're, we're pretty safe with it or without it. I don't want to badmouth, uh, I don't mean to badmouth Paula Bickel either. She's done a lot of good work, um, but she's treading on dangerous ground, you know, by working with the FDA and AMA and disclosing everybody, everybody's name and everybody, you know, it's a dangerous ground that I kind of tend to shy away from. Okay. Okay. 15 minute break. Sorry. <laughs>